We are now broadcasting. Hey, hey, people on Facebook and people who have come to this page on Zoom, we are creating an archive uh, in the series that we call the Nonprofit Chat. And the archive will go into our, our archive called Nonprofit Exchange. And tonight, I've got my colleague, whom you've seen on these for the last month, Russell Dennis. And um, we're going to do this one together. And it's, it's common questions that we hear a lot. So the, the topic tonight is we're going to address the questions that we've heard a lot. And certainly, if, if you have questions, you can go to the Facebook page and type in more. And we will continue to monitor this. Over the, over the last few weeks when we've done these, we have a few people watching live, but we've found that there are thousands of people that, that look at it after the fact on YouTube, on Facebook Live, and on some of the other places. Uh, Russell and I both, both have been pasting on LinkedIn pages, and we find a lot of professionals go on the LinkedIn page. So if you're not watching this live, you're watching a replay of it, and it's still relevant and we're still going to follow some of your comments. So we invite you to comment, even though you're not live. Um, Russell, are we broadcasting on Zoom as well? Uh, we are. Here we are. We are uh, on Zoom. And uh, we, we I'm coming to you from Aurora, Colorado. Hughes on the road. And we're ready at any time to delve into those five questions, uh, or those seven questions that are commonly asked now. When we were sort of talking this through, uh, there are many questions that nonprofit leaders have. And uh, so we tried to cover the, the seven most common. But uh, if you have other questions, we, we've got an eye on the Facebook page. Uh, other than the ones that we asked here, uh, by all means, send them in. And this, this uh, will be up and available for broadcast. So... Uh, if you're watching the replay, uh, by all means, uh, just keep posting questions and making comments to the replay so that we can address those questions on, on future broadcasts and keep that discussion open. This is a, a project of Center Vision Leadership Foundation, and uh, Russell and I are both what we call wayfinders. A wayfinder is our, our reframing of what we normally call a consultant. And a Wayfinder is more of a capacity building uh, re relationship partner than it is an authority person telling anybody what to do. We partner with nonprofit leaders to assist you in learning how to find the right answers for yourself rather than showing up as an expert with all the right answers. And um, Russell is, has been a great companion in the series and brings lots of depth and experience um, to it. And we've had a long journey, both of us, working with charities of various types and have certainly curriculum and ideas to share from the experiences we've had. So, uh, Russ, if you're ready to top in the questions, let's, let's hit the first one. You want to read them? And then uh, I think it's sort of like point counterpoint that uh, Jeff McGee and I do in Nonprofit Performance Magazine. We, we take a topic and we both weigh in on it. So we didn't talk about the methodology but if you like that one let's give let's have a go at it all right well then our first question that we agreed upon was if if i have a great vision for my charity why don't people donate let me go first and you go first next time i have a great vision but i'm not very good at the at the language of expressing that vision and um, I am in Florida today, and I'm on the road. I'm at CEO Space, which is a, a place where uh, thought leaders come together who are building an enterprise. There's people building nonprofits here and people building businesses. And actually, Russell and I met several years ago at CEO Space out in Las Vegas. And what I hear a lot of, not only here, Russell, and I'm sure you hear a lot of places, I hear people who tell me everything I don't need to know about what they're doing and aren't very good at capturing my attention with a very concise vision statement. So the reason people aren't adopting is because we are not good at the language, the compressed, concise, um, essential language that's gonna talk about what our vision is. 
So we, we don't really have that piece down. So let me, that's my piece. We're not attracting them because we're not really good at the language of defining the vision. All right. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I was uh, looking at an Australian publication and um, there was a, a fellow by the name of Jim Weber that talked about getting your mission clear. So if your value, vision, mission uh, aren't clear to the people, or it's not clear what that value is that you're providing, uh, they're not going to get it. So you, you have to be very transparent about it. Uh, and why you're doing the work that you're doing has to come through. Uh, because if that why matches the why that people want to support you, you're in pretty good shape. And uh, the author, Simon Sinek, had great material on that. He did a TED Talk on that. Uh, and he wrote a book uh, about why. And so, you know, his TED Talk was on how great leaders inspire action and and create that clarity that, that people have. So, uh when you're out there doing this nonprofit work, uh, one thing that's kind of hard to grasp at times is that uh, while it's something that I want to do, it may not be about me. It really has to be about those audiences that I'm serving. And with people that are donating, they've got different motivations. So it's important to, uh, that why you're doing what you're doing kind of connects with, with why they want to support you. It's... I like that. It's begin with why Simon Sinek, and that's a really important. Until people know why they need what you're doing, they don't care about all the what. So uh, let's go on to number two. That I think we we covered that one really well, Russ. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, one of the, one of the other things that 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 Jim Weber pointed out, and he was doing this based on Australia, but he he kind of put nonprofits into three different buckets. Uh, some were like localized or specialized, like schools and hospitals. Uh, others are solution-based. In other words, they focus on outcomes. And then you have some that are service-based. And uh, so with localized, specialized in Australia, uh, you don't have too many of those. Uh, Solution-based, where people focus on specific outcomes and values and what people get, there are very few in Australia, maybe 1%. And I haven't had a chance to research those numbers for here. Uh, service-based, there are tons of service-based organizations with mission statements that sound pretty, pretty close to the same. And uh, <laughs> not enough diversification in that. And people are bombarded with, with stuff that sounds the same. Uh, and you've got overlap and duplication, and that could create some problems, too. You know, you're so spot on. And um, we kind of blend into the woodwork, and nobody, nobody knows who we are. So what's the next question you got on your list there? Why don't you start after you read this one? Our, our second question is, how do I get my board of directors more actively engaged in fundraising? Um, what I've found, Hugh, is that a lot of people, when they're, when they're starting a new cause, they'll go out and they get people they know, like, and trust to come in and come on board and, hey, uh, we, we're kindred spirits. We want to see uh, these problems go away. Why don't you come in with me? Let's, uh, let's start a nonprofit and, and go change the world. And it's good to have people who are kindred spirits with the aligned values, but uh, you really have to kind of assess, the foundation, assess what it is that you need, what talents that you have, and what the expectations are that you're going to have for people that come in and serve. Uh, with board of directors, there's, there's just all sorts of thought. Uh, it ranges, uh, I've seen and talked to people, and it ranges from, we don't have anything at all to do with fundraising. We're here for governance and compliance. Fundraising is somebody else's problem to, oh, that's the only thing that the board of directors does. And so reality is really somewhere in the middle. But you've got to get agreement uh, on 
what that expectation is and, and what it looks like. Uh, one of the problems that you have with, with uh, board members who are, don't really engage in fundraising or may not be required to invest is that if you're talking to somebody who you're doing a capital campaign for, or you're, you're involved in plan giving, we're talking about long-term and substantial amounts of money. And it's pretty tough to ask one of these folks for a, a large contribution if your board is not chipping in. Why would we invest in your company if you're not putting in your own money into it? It could be a question that comes up. So it's really just, uh, you really have to figure out uh, what the roles are for people. And just because they don't want to fundraise, you know, they may not be a fit for your board if that's a requirement. But if they have skills that you need, and uh, I've seen recommendations, your board of directors should have three people who have knowledge, a good knowledge of finance, accounting, compliance, uh, and, and, and that type of thing. Good, strong financial backgrounds. That's an ideal board would have three or more people. Love it. So yeah, three or more. Um, mm -hmm. and, and there are numbers of streams of revenue and um, fundraising is, is a function of everybody that's in, in the organization. Now there are people who do it full time and we, like you say, there's expectations up front. I find it helpful to have a covenant that board members sign and part of their duty is to uh, be a participant in bringing players to the to the table who can um, who can help us create the revenue streams to do the work that's so important and if we don't have the revenue there's no point in having a board because there's yeah. no work that we're doing and and so it's not that we're full-time begging for money people it is that we've built the skill set to clearly define the value proposition for what we're doing so people understand why they need to support it and, and so it's building a culture of people that understand. And part of this is the board writes the strategy with you. They... Yes, well, the, with the board writing, uh, writing that strategy with you, a piece of that is really having a culture of fundraising. And a culture of fundraising is where everybody takes uh, an active role in making sure that uh, the organization has the resources that you need. It's a team effort. And the organizations that have the most success uh, with raising funds have a culture of fundraising. And that's covered in masterful detail in the report that uh, Compass Point Nonprofit Services did with the, with the Haas Foundation back in 20. 14, and the data is about four years old. Uh, but what they found out in that study was that there was too heavy a reliance on the development professional, development director, grant writer, or whatever person they had in that role to actually go out and make money uh, and to bring in money to the organization. Uh, in a lot of cases, they had varying degrees of influence with the board, varying degrees of influence with the uh, executive director. And so that's a report uh, that would be worth reading. Uh, and we will put that up in, in, our, in our notes uh, for you to, to look at uh, for that culture of fundraising. And to look at that study to see what sorts of things that it revealed. Uh, so really, though, uh, as far as the board of directors goes on that question, it's an individual matter uh, based on your organizational goals. And these are things that you that you have agreement upon or you look to have agreement upon when you're building that foundation to decide uh, what roles each, each person is going to take and what those will look like. Uh, on the other side, if you do have an organization that requires that your board of directors participate. No phone connected. Uh, then, ah, you're back. <laughs> so yeah. just, just to finish the point I was making, 
if you uh, do determine that fundraising should be a responsibility of board members and you've got talented people who absolutely positively don't want to fundraise, uh, make sure that if they're in, they're in alignment with what you're trying to do, find a way to utilize their talents. Don't kick them to the curb because a strong team uh, is, is essential in every area of operation. Absolutely. And sorry, I lost the signal there for a minute, but it logged me back in. Um, and you're, you said something in that really good explanation of an agreement and having agreement in place with board members because we as leaders – if we don't define the expectations, then we are actually creating some problems. We're creating conflict right there. So thank you for that, that wisdom on the board. I, I think we've covered that one, Russ. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're on a three, number three. Our, our third question is why don't more people volunteer for projects they seem to be interested in? And you know, that that's a great segue from the board member question because uh, yeah we uh, yeah what what happens with, with a lot of organizations is they don't necessarily look at what's in it for the people that they're asking to come on board and building that solid foundation uh, you have to have those agreed upon goals no phone connected goals need to be aligned with what those individuals want what is it that they want out of that experience of coming to work with you to volunteer as a servant leader um what are their motivations so they could be looking for a number of things are they looking to build a resume are they retired and looking to fill, fill time, uh, looking to do something that matters? Have they uh, tired of their corporate career? Uh, are they trying to build their profile in the community to run for office? Is it a student looking for credit or a class project? So there's so many different reasons that somebody might be motivated to volunteer with you. And so these were some of the things that I covered in the broadcast I did on Nonprofit Culture Success a few weeks ago, uh, entitled Win, 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 and it's creating uh, propositions that are good for the people who work with you, the people you serve, and the people who pay for those services. So it's really important to understand what their motivations are. And uh, different people, as I said, volunteer for different reasons. But, but here's the thought. If you're, if you're looking for volunteers in the form of people working in your organization or outside of your organization to do some pro bono work, what's in it for them? What, what is it that they want? How can you, with the cause that you're fighting for, how can you make serving with you attractive to people who are doing professional services, students, to retired people. Um, what sort of things could you do to make that volunteer experience worthwhile? And yeah, you would handle volunteers the same way that you would hire talent. If you're looking to put talented people on the payroll, to have them serve as advisors, uh, you need to create an experience for volunteers that's just as good. Uh, they may want some personal development. You know, they're looking for something within that, uh, within the context of working with you and for you. So it has to be a meaningful experience. So find well, out as much as you can about the people that you're asking to come uh, serve with you. And uh, that's really what it boils down to. So much of what, what we're talking about is relationships. And there are ways to do that. Uh, and we don't have time to discuss them all, but let us know if that's something that you're interested in, in finding ways to engage your volunteers or to engage anybody with your organization. And we'll talk about putting programs together to make sure that you have the tools to do that. Our, uh, yeah, and, and, and Russ, the, um, I, I agree with all of that. You're so good at um, highlighting that because we really the reason people show up is because they have a passion for something and statistics show that um, the more you ask of people the more they're going to do 
because it's meaningful work and they're actually connecting their passion to meaningful work. I, another perspective that I've been somewhat successful with organizations is eliminating the word volunteer there. And you talked about being a servant. It, they're really servant leaders in a very specific channel. So part of it is, is okay, we don't have volunteers and people are going to throw up their hands and say, what are you, are you crazy? Well, yeah, that might be, but uh, let's, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to build a team of servant leaders. They're community leaders in action. And it really reframes the whole commitment piece that I'm a leader, I can do something. And people don't always perceive themselves in a leadership position. So we finding out what they want, it's a channel that they're in and they have a certain level of authority in that leadership position. And you don't give away everything, but they have a certain area that they're responsible for. And we actually interfere with that because we want to do too much for them when really they're maybe more capable than we are in some of those areas. So I agree with everything that, that you say, but I'm thinking also let's reframe this whole paradigm that's broken. People aren't volunteering, so maybe we need to do something different. Well, you know, in the win, 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 uh, Frank, uh, this is an opportunity for people to partner with us to solve a problem. And when we couch it that way, uh, we, we have a better chance, I think, of garnering the support that we need. But partnership, it, it, it's looking at building a partnership and creating value, which are terms that are <laughs> not necessarily uh, uh, congruent with, with the way things have been. But it's starting to become more a, a part of the discussion as are things like uh, social return on investment and, and impact. Uh, those can be overused, but uh, those social returns as well as monetary returns are starting to become more important because people are looking at both to see what sort of value that you bring. Absolutely. I'm looking at our hour here. and we What do we finish? Three questions? We got four to go? We've got four to go, yeah. Shall we move on? We shall. Uh, question number four. I run a nonprofit. Doesn't that mean we can't make a profit? Ooh, you want to go first? You want me to go first? Oh, go for it. Well, we have to make a profit if we're going to accomplish our, our mission. And our mission is to do some, some as, you, as you talked out earlier, talked about earlier, we want to create impact in people's lives. We want to change what's going on. We want to do things that the government and business are not able to do. So there's a, there's a more need today for the work of nonprofits than ever before. And we, we put on the dumb hat when we use the word nonprofit. And I think it's really moving to a different languaging here as well as we let go of the volunteer, their servant leaders. Well, now we're letting go of nonprofit. It's a tax exempt charity. And um, it's an IRS classification. Now there's, there's more rules for us in, in that classification. However, we're doing very specialized work. And so part of it is reframing our thinking. And, and we must make a profit. The difference in a for-profit and a nonprofit is that people can donate to you and take a deduction because it's a philanthropic uh, gift. It's also, we cannot distribute the profits to individuals. The, the assets of the organization must go for its specified work. The IRS approved Center Vision Leadership Foundation because we educate people and help them build their ability to run their charity like we're doing now, Russ. So our, our very specific niche is to help build capacity in boards and leadership for charities. And that's what we do. And we need to drive revenue to be able to have the website to do the magazine, to have the, the technology to do what we're doing right now. And that's all based on having more money left over uh, than when we started. And we call that profit. But profit also has other meanings besides money. We're not going to go there now, but profit means you have positive cash flow to do the things that you've been called to do. How's that? That's very good. That's very, very good. You know, here's the thing with, with, with uh, and, and it's all a language thing, but here's the thing. Nonprofits have to operate at a surplus, which is just another word for profit. 
if you spend more money then you take it and at some point you're going to cease to operate it doesn't matter what your tax tax is you've got to keep the funds flowing so uh there's a group called uh altruism partners and they had 10 things that they look at 10 ways that you can spot uh, the best nonprofits out there uh, and there's a heavy emphasis on finance. Uh, now, one of the things that's really odd about nonprofits versus for-profits is that it's highly recommended and you're viewed as being high performance and highly effective if you have six months of operating reserves just in case the funding dries up. Now, how many nonprofits have it? I don't, you know, I don't know how many for-profit businesses have that. But the National Council of Nonprofits in their 2015 survey found that only 23% of the organizations they had six months of operating revenue on hand. In the, in the surplus that they could tap into. And 12% of the organizations had fewer than 30 days of operating funds on hand. So it's, uh, it's important to have that surplus if you can get it, uh, very important. So I don't know how many rev, uh, organizations uh, have that kind of surplus, but money makes the whole thing move, like it or not. <laughs> Well, it's sort of the gas that makes the car go, isn't it? That's it. No fuel. Yeah, we can't build a car. You, you'll be yeah, you don't go short. anywhere. Do you? <laughs> yeah. All right, we're doing pretty good. We're halfway. We got three to go. Yeah. So, question number five is: How can we keep a steady source of revenue coming in? Mm, why don't you kick this one off? Why don't you start? This yeah. One? Well, you know, the thing that I was looking at uh, yesterday talked about social return on investment. Um, Tom Rouser calls it uh, asking rights. And there are a lot of different names for it. But having, having a strong social return on investment, uh, there's some things that you make clear. Uh, first, you make it clear who it is, uh, who or what you change, uh, what those changes actually are. You've got evidence that some changes have taken place. Uh, you measure your other major influence and you talk about the percentage of the problem you're solving. And a lot of these measures involve having strong financial controls, being able to forecast your revenues uh, and your able to really quantify that impact that you're making. So you don't have long stories or manipulative appeals, but you've got crisp, concise, and comprehensive value statements. Uh, and you can explain what it is that you're doing. That's where it, where it sort of starts is to have that clarity on that steady source. Now, there are a number of different types of funding that are available. Uh, you have sponsorships, for example, and those are great. But a lot of a lot of nonprofits approach local businesses that are run by their friends or colleagues, uh, asking for sponsorship uh, dollars, maybe auction donations could be a number of things without necessarily um, asking or uh, offering something uh, of value. And there's a difference between the sponsorship and the donation. A donation is something uh, that is given without an expectation of a return. Uh, the landscape on that is starting to change, and that's, that's for another discussion. Uh, when you have a business that sponsors you, uh, what sort of value proposition is the nonprofit given that business? Uh, is an audience share? Uh, maybe you can put the kind of people that they target for customers in front of them. Uh, you may be able to provide an opportunity to them, for them to get some goodwill they can't uh, buy with an advertising spread. So you got to be clear on what's in it for them and what they get out of it. 
Uh, grants are another source, yeah. and there are just uh, there are a lot of different type of grants. You've got private foundations, family foundations, you have community foundations, uh, you have government grants. So each of those entities is a little bit different. Uh, what Dan Pallotta point out in the way that we think about charities is, is all wrong, is that a lot of organizations don't fully quantify the cost to deliver a service because of this notion of overhead versus program. And that's going to be covered in another question. Uh, but we've got to calculate those costs. So in some cases, grants will work. In other cases, grants won't. Uh, individual donors. Now, you've got different types of, of ways that individual donors can, can give. But in a lot of instances, these funds are not restricted in general. But if it comes through a bequest or planned giving, that might be a different matter. Uh, you do have more flexibility with uh, individual funds because they don't have as many restrictions as grant or government or foundation funds may have. So those are just three of the different sources uh, of funding that may be out there, and we could really go deep in the, into that discussion, but uh, it all depends. Let me add four. It all There's depends. five more. Yeah. I'm sorry, I got my mind's breaking up. I didn't mean to interrupt you. There's five oh. more. Let me go on with the others. So you got you got sponsorships, you got donations, and you've got um, grants that you've covered so far. Um, there's also in kind. It, that's not really money, but it saves you paying rent if they give you space. It saves you printing, and some companies even will donate ten hours a week of one of their employee to do something specific for you. So the the in kind donation is is a fourth one. And then um, churches and rotaries and other organizations have money. They want to see certain things happen. I call this partner. You partner with them. They got the money. You got the program. Mm -hmm. So you put together a lot of small donations from churches and, ch and charities. A good example for that would be uh, like a, a free clinic or a food bank. Mm -hmm. You know, they get supported by a number of churches, a number of rotaries or another civic organization. So I call that partner money because it's not really a grant. It's not really a sponsorship. It's not really a donation. They have a specific thing that they'd like to see done, and you're going to do it, and there's no reporting like in a grant. The other one is planned giving. Uh, people want to leave uh, a certain amount of money in their will. Uh, so there's wills and bequests, and, and working with a financial planner to help that person understand the the best way to position it for their taxes. Mm -hmm. And the reason that we have a 501c3 is that people can get deductions for giving us money. And then the last one is e events, which is could be negative cash flow, but it engages people together. And we could do silent auctions. You could have events. Uh, I used to do concerts in my churches, which uh, were ticketed events. Um, we can do uh, uh, events and people can make donations at the event, but an event builds your tribe. It also builds income. And so there's numbers of ways sponsoring a, a, an artist with a concert and you sell tickets, you know, you have positive cash flow from that. So there's eight, eight real dependable ways that you could activate. And if you have real estate or someone wants to give you real estate, then you could turn that into income. Uh, you could save rent or you could rent it out or you could uh, put it into a property manager who could then generate revenue. So if it's given to the charity, you can't take it out, but it's, it's got to, it's got to stay in a philanthropic use, but you could repurpose it and you can work with your, with your lawyer and uh, a, a, a facility manager uh, to monetize real estate for positive gain. So that's nine. If, uh, if you really want to be creative. So, uh, I think there are lots of ways, and if we only have one, we're going to struggle. So I encourage people to think of more than one. And uh, you put a lot of context around those first three. That was very helpful, Russ. Mm. You know, Hugh, that there's a tenth one that that I didn't talk about, and mm. you know, more than seven in ten uh, have this particular thing in their in their uh, arsenal. It, it's, it's, it's value added piece for service. Yeah, some nonprofits, they, they can charge a fee 
for the services they offer to people that can afford to pay. And that's a big part of their revenue mix. Uh, so they have some fees to offset some of those costs in, in the similar or related business that generates a revenue. And so uh, that's something that you have to look at as well. And uh, it's a pretty important well, uh, piece absolutely. of that mix. Yeah. Absolutely. That's um, what I would call earned income. Yeah. Um, it's like a business line of income. Like um, I sell my magazines. That's, mm -hmm. that's, you know, it's, that's a piece. Uh, sell online learning programs. That's a piece. Mm -hmm. um, I have uh, Kroger in my neighborhood. It's the second largest retailer in the country, but they run grocery stores and they have an affinity card, your, your membership card, and you can tie it to a charity and they'll donate 5% of your purchases to a charity. So there's a number of organizations, companies that do that. So that's a whole area of earned income. And I think that's a, one we haven't talked about much, but that's a very real, we have to be careful there. And, you know, having, you have some, you've had some experience with IRS. We want to make sure that it's relevant so they don't tax it as unrelated business income. Oh yeah. That's, you've always got to be uh, careful of that compliance and, and, <clears throat> So, you know, one of the things uh, that I looked at was, uh, were there some alternatives to starting a nonprofit? And there, there were a couple of business entities, such as a B Corp or a Benefits Corporation, and nonprofits can own one of those in a related business. They can go out and raise capital the same way that uh, oh. large for-profit businesses can do. But it really, all of that is really, it's, it's in context of what your organization does. So what your options are depend a lot on, on where you're at. The last thought that I had in, with, with, uh, with fundraising types is that it's probably not good in general to have all your eggs in one basket. Uh, it may make sense. And certain types of fundraising are gonna make more sense for some organizations than others. Uh, diversity in, is important to sustainability. On the flip side of that, if you are chasing too many different types of revenue, you might be spreading yourself thin and you're, you're doing your fundraising badly. So there's a balance to be struck. Uh, what do you think about that, Hugh? Well, you're, you're spot on. And that's another reason for board engagement. Because if you have eight streams of revenue, nine, seven, three, you really want to have uh, somebody on your board that's, that's helping you oversee that. And, and so that's where having, having more board members can be helpful, as long as you're intentional about what they do and what their level of oversight is. Because a board doesn't run the day-to-day, -day, but they do have fiduciary oversight and governance uh, input to the organization. So that's uh, you, subject to your active the level of the board being active and how many people there are is feeds into this too. Well, yeah, if you have a point person on your board, <clears throat> it's really best if you can to have what they call a fundraising committee. And you've got a, a team that focuses on that. It, it should be something that if you had the right culture, everybody's got an eye out for. But if you've got a committee uh, that helps to, to spread the responsibility and, and to support everybody so that it's not one, two, or a few people in the organization, but everybody's thinking about how to sustain it. Uh, your chances are gonna be a lot better of coming up with ways to do that. And it's not so burdensome that, that people shy away from it altogether because you've got a shared sense of responsibility and a, a shared workload. And more, more hands makes the work lighter. Love it, love it. We're doing good. We got just a couple of questions left and we're right on track. Yeah. Well, we're actually at question seven, Hugh. Oh, are we? we are at question number seven. Uh, and that is why are donors so interested in overhead and how do I respond to them to let them know why we need to pay salaries to do and do effective marketing in order to grow? And that um, you've spoken about that video from Dan Pilata. He addresses that square on. Do you agree with him? I agree uh, wholeheartedly with him. He, he points out some things that are very important in this changing landscape 
Uh, and there's, it, it's unfair to nonprofits to view the old view that a lot of people have that you're wasting money by going out and hiring the most talented people you can find by using technology as a way to stay engaged with your audience uh, by doing all of the things that profit making companies they expect uh, the people that uh, work in corporations they hold stock in to go out and do the best marketing and get the best talent that they can get to grow their revenues but their whole point of view shifts when they're looking at uh, a, a nonprofit or not for profit somehow they think the calculus changes on on getting the best people you get the best people you get the best results and so it's important to use all of the tools that are available to you because you're you're marketing you're building relationships you've got to show effectiveness and that effectiveness is in the bottom line and with nonprofits, you've got a dual bottom line. How much impact and change are you making in the lives of, of people and in the community? And are you doing that at a surplus? So it's it's really important to uh, Very get, good. get with that. And, and in your calculation for program costs, you have to factor in the cost of people and marketing the same way you would with a profit making business. And I, I think we need to rethink uh, and talk to our accountants about how they classify things because in, in Center Vision Leadership Foundation, you could say that 100% of our, over, our, our money we spend on is overhead mm -hmm. because we're spending 100% of our time delivering value to people. Mm -hmm. And, or you could say it's zero overhead it just depends on how you classify what we're doing. And we purpose everything that we do toward the value that we bring to, to charities. It, it just goes right to the end use. And, and part of what I do is help people create content and deliver content. And we're working directly with, um, with charities. So this is, um, it's kind of a fuzzy area and people we, we want to have a fiduciary accountability in that we're not just there to support fat salaries of the people that run it. And I don't have a fat salary. I don't have a salary. So in my case, that's not true. Uh, in some cases, I've there's some big numbers which are okay, but is that person actually there driving the revenue of the organization mm -hmm. and taking it to the next level? And did we have to take them out of corporate America to be able to do the job they know how to do? So it's a, it's a complex question, but we have to give donors the value proposition. This is what's happening with your money. And it's, it's an educational piece, I believe. Yeah, you have to be able to tell a story with those numbers. Uh, you can spit a number out and say, well, we spent so much per participant, but you have to tie it back to your goals, your objectives, your mission, uh, you know, if you, if you say, well, you know, we, we fed so many people, uh, you have to talk about how many meals that gets, uh, how many people have gone to work that you served who were homeless. Uh, how many of you, have, you know, where, how, what are those dollars done to get them off the streets? How many of those people are in homes, furnished homes and safe housing? Uh, the numbers have to be tied to a story so that people understand that you've got a measurable movement, but you can see real change in people's lives, too. And that's a tough balance to strike, but it's not impossible. And, <clears throat> and when you hire people, uh, I don't have a problem if a nonprofit can pay a, an ED $500,000, uh, I think that's fine if that ED brings in $20 million and uh, you've got somebody you paid $250,000 that only bought in a million, uh, I would say that extra $250,000 is well spent if you multiply your revenue by 20 times. Absolutely. Absolutely. We've got this, like I said earlier, we put on this nonprofit stupid hat and think we can't do um, good business practices in our charities. So, um, Russell David Dennis, uh, you're a man of great wisdom. Uh, thank you for being 
the partner in the in probing these complex questions. And this will be up on a variety of media. It will be on um, the podcast that we call the Nonprofit Exchange, which you can find for any kind of smartphone or tablet. The Nonprofit Exchange. And um, we have uh, Russell. We have about ten thousand listeners on my two podcasts. That one is has been out there for a few years, and uh, your previous session has several hundred uh, downloads. So it's you've. Uh, you've got some good messages and people are catching on to it. So thank you for being my partner in this one. Well, it's always a pleasure. And, you know, we've got a lot of work to do. There are a lot of problems uh, occurring out there. And there, there's a, it's an uphill climb for all of the social problems that we have. And nonprofits are here to lead the way. Now, we don't have all of the dollars that government has, but what we do have are people who are passionate, on the ground who are creating innovative solutions that can be replicated. And that's where the value comes in. You know, uh, a lot of these government programs that have grown to scale, they started somewhere in a nonprofit uh, when people got out there and proved that a model could get out there and make a difference. So we really have our work cut out in areas of education and delivering health care, keeping people healthy, uh, dealing with homelessness and hunger and any multitude of problems out there. Uh, and uh, so it's going to take some collaboration. It'll, it'll take a lot of resources, but collaboration. Uh, you know, this idea of, of mergers, uh, had caught fire with, with corporate and profit-making enterprises. Maybe we ought to look at that with nonprofits because when I see all these small ones with overlap, they all have talent, they all mean well, but we could probably get more bang for the buck. And uh, maybe that's something we should look at down the road. Collaboration is always Amen. in bold, but I, I think for, from a nonprofit perspective, we might need to entertain that on a larger scale if we're going to make a dent in these multitude of problems that we're facing. Love it. Wise words, sir. Um, so this will be up for a while. If you want to uh, get on the list so we, we inform you what's going on, go to nonprofitchat.org, O-R-G, nonprofitchat.org, and uh, you'll find a place to sign up for the mailing list. Russell, it's been great. Um, thank you for being on this this nonprofit exchange tonight. Well, thank you, Hugh. And as always, I, I thank all of you nonprofit leaders that are out there every day on the front lines making a positive difference in the lives of other people. Uh, your champions, your heroes, we want to help you continue to be able to do that. And we'll be right here next week uh, doing what we can to provide you useful and timely information and resources and tools to get there. Tuesdays at 7. Love it. Thank you, Russell. Good night. Good night, Hugh.